beautifully for all of the things that we face as Christians and all of the things, the places that we need Jesus in our lives.
to you today from our church's bus garage. Why am I here across the parking lot in the bus garage? Well, I'm here to invite you to our First Reformed Church rummage sale. We've been doing some cleaning of our long-term storage spaces over in our main building, and we've got a lot of things we'd like to give back to you. They just aren't getting used right now the way they used to be, and we want to send them back to you, our members. So what we're doing is we're putting out all kinds of good stuff. We've got coffee pots, we've got roasters, there's some record players, there's artwork. Uh, we've got all kinds of old things from our church and new things that we're just not using and we'd love to give them back to you. So here's the plan. Beginning on Monday morning at 8 a.m., the door over here will be open and you can come in, take what you want, and then pay what you want. Just bring it over to Mary Lee Penning's office. Whatever you think's a fair price, you name it, pay it, or at least drop it in her slot and it's yours to keep. Second announcement to make for you is that we are going to be extending the time for Operation Christmas Child donations. We'll be receiving those now through October 31. So check out the little display in the southeast corner of the Fellowship Hall or talk to Mrs. B, Leanne Bonacroy, or Sarah Kuyper, Mrs. K about those things. Two other quick notes about schedule. It's starting to feel a little bit like the fall. I've got my sweatshirt on today. We will be planning on having our Thanksgiving Eve service again this year at 6.30 p.m. And as a long distance look ahead, our Christmas Eve services will be at 4 p.m., 6 p.m., and 11 p.m. So mark your calendar for those special services. That's all I've got for today. Have a blessed day. Welcome. It is good to be here with you this morning. My name's Amanda. I'm the worship leader here. And I don't know about you, but sometimes by the time Sunday comes around, I am mentally, spiritually, and emotionally just done. I'm kind of shot. And so I don't know about you, but I need to come to be refreshed, to be reminded again of who God is, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and learn again about Jesus with my church family. You guys find yourselves there too? Yeah. Then let's do that. Let's pray together to start this morning. Father, you are good. You are everything that we need. You are our satisfaction and where we find our hope. You are high and exalted, and yet you know us exactly as we are. Come, Holy Spirit. Inhabit the praises of your people and remind us again just how good you are, how much you love us, and how we can trust you at all times. Be the leader of our time together, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together at your name.
ever believe that? Those are the things that this culture tells us every day as Christians, every single day. But friends, we say with the writer of Hebrews, we are not those who give up hope and so are lost, but we are of the company who live by faith and so we are saved. We do not shy away. We do not back down. We stand firm, engaging with those around us, declaring again the truth that Jesus is King of kings. Jesus is Lord of lords. He is the answer to the world's deepest need. Let's sing together. Raise a hallelujah.
Pastor Mark is going to lead us into a time of prayer. Let's pray together. Lord, today we declare our dependence on you. And we come before you with our praise and our thanksgiving. Lord, our worship, our very selves, our soul, Lord, we laid wide open for you. And Lord, without a doubt, there's a, a mix of emotions, a mix of feelings as we gather in worship, of that of praise and worship and adoration and love, and that of maybe fear, sadness, and pain. Lord, we come before you here today recognizing that your love is greater than all of those. And we worship you because you first loved us. Jesus, you came to earth, sent by the Father to be our Savior, our Redeemer, our friend. Lord, as we worship you here this day and mindful of the season, as October is coming to an end and soon November is around the corner, fall transitioning to winter, we're mindful of how the earth is filled with awe at your wonders. Where the morning dawns and the evening fades, it calls forth joy. And Lord, according to the psalmist, you care for the land and water it. You enrich it abundantly. The streams of God are filled with water. You provide the people with grain, and so you have ordained it. You drench its furrows and level its ridges. You soften it with showers and bless its crops. You crown the year with your bounty, and your carts overflow with abundance. Lord, we praise you for your goodness and how you care for us each and every day. Lord, this morning we pray specifically for Laura Brandt recovering from a fall. Lord, bring healing to her body. And Lord, we pray for Diane and John Van Wyk. Lord, we express our sympathies and our love to Diane at the sudden loss of her sister this past week. Lord, we lay these before you. We give all of our feelings to you, Jesus, our Savior, Redeemer, and friend. And all God's people said, amen. Jesus' shoulders are strong enough to, car to carry all of those things that Pastor Mark prayed about and all of those things that are weighing heavy on our heart. As we sing together this beautiful hymn of faith, let it be a time where you are doing what the psalmist says, that you are casting your burdens on the Lord and letting him sustain you, for he will never permit the righteous to be moved. Let's stand together and sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. So
seated. At this time, Promise Kids are dismissed to go downstairs and spend some time learning about Jesus. Perfect. Thank you. Summer 2012. It was an otherwise unremarkable day in the southern Russian province of Tatarstan until local police made a discovery that was both extraordinary and terrifying. Deep beneath the basement of a Muslim cleric's house, local authorities discovered an underground village housing 65 men, women, and children. This subterranean complex, which was compared to catacombs by the investigators, went down eight levels deep and contained vast numbers of rooms, many of which appeared to have been dug directly out of the Russian soil. This cleric, known to many above ground, was an 83-year-old named Fizrachman Satarov. As a young man in the 1960s, Satarov had interpreted the sparks coming from a trolley cable to be a sign from God, and he began to build out a cult which placed himself at the center. Over time, this cult became more and more suspicious of society and increasingly withdrew from community life until in the early 2000s, Satarov declared that almost all of his members must move underground into an anthill-like colony located beneath the town of Kazan. There, he believed, he and his members would be protected from the sinful and wicked influences of the outside world. When this complex was discovered in 2012, many of the group's 27 children had never once seen the sun. They'd lived their entire existences beneath the surface of the ground. Thankfully, history records that many of the cult's members were restored to physical wellness by local health personnel. But their spiritual longing to live their lives underground proved much harder to shake. In fact, when municipal leaders ordered the entire complex to be demolished, some of the members of the sect vowed to throw themselves in front of the bulldozers rather than to see this underground lair, their religious safe haven, destroyed. Now, there may not be a more extreme example than the cult of Satarov, but there is an impulse at work in this story that's probably a little bit more familiar than we'd like to admit. It's all about taking your faith underground. Being an undercover believer, if not physically, then metaphorically. This is about turning away from society, recoiling from a broken and confused world to withdraw into a private, safe spirituality. 
And you don't need a spade or a backhoe. You don't have to go underneath the surface of the soil to know what I'm talking about. Today's message, our seventh in the Big God series, is all about making sure that our Christian faith remains above ground and engaged with the world around us. I've entitled this talk, Lift Up the Manhole Cover, and it's a discussion about the relationship that you and I are called to have with society around us. This is the question, what does Reformed theology envision to be the proper relationship between the church and culture? Culture. Well, probably the first thing that we should do is uh, offer a working definition of the word culture. Culture is actually a word that's derived from agriculture, right? Cultivation. And we might say that our culture is the human environment, the the social system in which we grow up. Merriam-Webster puts it this way, culture is the customary beliefs, social forms, and material traits of a racial, religious, or social group And it's the set of shared attitudes, values, goals, and practices that characterizes an institution or an organization. In other words, culture, church, is the totality of a group's shared social existence. It includes media and language and worldview. It's a pattern of behavior and of assumptions. So what is our culture today? What is it defined by? Well, lots of things. Our culture today is the English language and instant coffee. It's Beyonce and Pitbull and Taylor Swift. It's the internet and the airport. It's politics and movies. It's Pat Sajak and McDonald's and Walmart and high school football on Friday nights. Our culture is the sum total of our experiences and our expectations. I think it's important to note before we go any further that culture is never static. Culture is always changing. It's always evolving. It's always growing and shape-shifting. It differs according to the place. It evolves with world events. It morphs according to the innovations of art and athletics. And it changes with the passage of time. Those of you who are older can identify this more easily than those who are younger, simply by thinking about who and what was popular in a given generation. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to give you a picture on the screen, and I want you just to shout out for me which decade's culture is being depicted on the screen. Just shout out the decade. Here's the first one. Yeah, so we've got flower power, we've got Volkswagens and guitars, and yeah, peace symbols, and I think there may be a mushroom on there too. Yes, this is the 60s. How about this next picture? The 90s, yeah, Bill Clinton and, the, and uh, rollerblades, and there's a Game Boy in there. Uh, this is the kind of culture in which I grew up. How about this last one? What is this era? That's the 50s, right? The Cleaver family. You can tell it's been a while because it's, yeah, it's, it's been a minute since uh, dads would like go out and clean the gutters and go to t-ball games wearing suits and ties. Uh, It's been a while. Pastor Mark, maybe you could bring that back. I don't know, but just always, that's the 50s. And culture changes over time. And culture is powerful in every moment. It's always acting on us. It's always shaping us. And often it presses against our Christian values and virtues. Culture does not always 
run in tandem with our convictions as believers. And so the question we want to answer this morning is this, how should our Christian convictions intersect with our cultural experiences? What is the proper relationship between the church and culture, between Christ and the world and society in which we live? Around 70 years ago, a Yale theologian named Richard Niebuhr made a well-known attempt to categorize how Christians in different places and at different times have answered that question. How did they respond to social change and to cultural pressure? Well, I don't have time to go deep into this rundown, but I would just run down a couple of things that that Niebuhr said have been the responses of Christians to culture throughout the years. Some have said, and let's just use the cross as our symbol, that Christ should be above culture, that the church should direct how culture operates. And in fact, for about a thousand years, during a period we call Christendom, this is, in a sense, what happened. Niebuhr talked about Christ being against culture in which there's conflict between the church and the culture around. He says that sometimes there's a a kind of a relationship where Christ agrees with culture, where they kind of run together and function as one, and the church tends to sort of get nod toward and follow the leader, as it were, with what the culture is doing. And he also talked about the church kind of in paradox with culture, in which there's always a yes and a no in this relationship between how followers of Christ live and work and think and act and how the culture around functions. So I don't have time, again, to go deep into any of those particular models, but what I would like to do this morning is offer a couple ideas for how people today are still continuing to respond to this particular question. How should the church engage with culture? Again, today I'm going to be much less nuanced, but I'd like to offer a couple of big picture ideas sort of on a spectrum. Again, these are more like folders or groupings, and we're not going to be super precise, but I would like to introduce you to a couple of concepts and then share with you what I think a reformed vision for engaging with culture is. So again, if this is a range, on one end of the range, we have the idea of assimilation. Assimilation. And assimilation is, I think, fair to say, a hallmark of more progressive Christians. And for those who think this way, culture should be almost in total embraced by the church. They would say that God is really behind everything that happens in the world, and the church must therefore mirror the trends of society. It should, to use another word, conform to the culture. Culture knows what it's doing, and the church in response must evolve based on the current cultural moment. So if this is a train, then culture is the locomotive, and the church is the caboose, and the church kind of just needs to get with the times. By the way, getting with the times is exactly what the word secular means. It means nowism, being with the times. Assimilation. The problem with this view however, is that the Bible explicitly teaches against it. Romans 12 verse 2 says, do not conform 
to the pattern of this world. Don't do that. Don't just go along with whatever the world says. And I think you'd agree that there are aspects of our culture that we as believers cannot tolerate, we cannot support, much less copy and obey. Because culture can become toxic. It can disregard the value of human life. It can support cruel systems of racial or financial oppression. It can, as Isaiah 5 verse 20 says, it can call evil good and good evil. And the danger of assimilation is that the church becomes so much like the world that it has nothing to offer to the world. No word of redemptive contrast to what the world is saying. No distinctiveness and therefore no hope. Assimilation. Now at the other end of the spectrum we might say is an idea we could call escapism. Escapism. I mean, it's, it's exactly what it sounds like, right? We've got to escape culture. If you subscribe to this notion, you believe that it is best to get as far away from the prevailing culture as possible. To stay underground, metaphorically speaking. To live beneath the manhole cover. And why would you think that? Well, you look around and you'd say, this world is absolutely lost. And there's no chance at redemption. Culture is dangerous, and more importantly, it's infectious, and we do not want to be contaminated by our culture. These folks, you might have guessed, tend to be far more conservative in their worldview. And among the escapists historically have been, well, you can think about this, right? Picture this, monks and nuns who leave society and go off to live in the wilderness because they don't want to interact with it. And in slightly less escapist versions, you have separatists like the Amish and the Quakers and uh, the Mennonites. Just got to get away. Run away and hide. But scripturally speaking, there's a problem with this view as well. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. That Jesus there instructs his believers to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go into the world. Don't run away from it. Don't hide from it. Don't try to escape from it. Actually go into that world. So assimilation and then escapism. Now, you might look at this whiteboard and hear these ideas and you think, okay, Pastor Tim, those, those are like total and polar opposites. Right? They have nothing alike. And in one sense, you'd be correct. If you viewed these people day to day, hour to hour, you'd see vast differences in actually how they go about their lives. But here's the twist I want to suggest to you, First Reformed Church. I actually think that these two perspectives, these two reactions, actually have a common theological center. Because I think that both of them sell short the power of the gospel. Because both the secularists and the separatists seem to assume that the church is not strong enough to hold up in the midst of culture. Assimilation says we're never going to win, so let's just go with the flow. Escapism says we're never going to win, so let's head underground. But don't you see, both of these perspectives imply culture's going to end up winning no matter what. So in one form or another, let's wave the white flag and concede. 
And I'm here to tell you this morning, church, that Reformed theology will not give up ground that quickly. Reformed theology is far more optimistic than this. See, the real contrast is not among these two, but between these two and Reformed theology. And the model that many Reformed thinkers hold is gospel transformation. Engagement with, but never concession to, the culture around us. In this vision for cultural engagement, the body of Christ lives in a dynamic relationship with culture so that the church is always presenting its gospel witness to society and so that culture teaches us and informs us about the best means and methods for that witness. And if you've been following along in this series on Reformed Theology, you probably have a sense for why this would be the Reformed view. This way of looking at God and people and the wider world is an implication and an outgrowth of some of these other theological themes upon which we've already hit. Quick review. We re- believe, do we not, that God is sovereign over this whole planet. And he's interested in all of it. We believe in Christ alone as Lord over all. And we're sure that all things come together for his glory. We believe that all persons in all places, even those who disagree with us, are made in the image of God. We believe that sin is strong, so we have to be wary, but we believe that Jesus is stronger, so we don't have to be afraid. This is an implication of Reformed theology, but it's also a very clear direction from our leader himself. And one of the best and tightest expressions of this vision for engaging culture is found in Jesus' prayer for his followers, his disciples and us, that's found in John 17. Look at these verses. They, he's talking about us, are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth, for your word is truth. And as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Have you ever heard that old Christian saying that uh, believers are supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. That that phrasing isn't exactly in the Bible, but I think you'd agree with me, wouldn't you, that John 17 is pretty close? The Reformed view of Christ and the culture, church and society, aims to manifest Jesus' prayer, to see that Jesus' prayer comes true in us. As his followers, we are not to flee from this world. We have a mission to this world. We just sang about it in Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Go to a world that is dying. People out there are dying. And we can't just leave them. And at the same time, we are not to be conformed in total to our culture, but rather to be sanctified by the truth. We will not live in the dark when the world needs light. We won't blend in when society needs a courageous contrast. And the reformed understanding of the gospel 
is a confident understanding. We believe that the gospel is beautiful and winsome and also that it is strong and transformative and that it must be proclaimed in our society today. So as a result of all this thinking, the conclusion is, and I hope you'll come there with me, that Reformed Christians live among and amid our culture. We celebrate the many good things that come from our culture. Medicine and art and health technology, things like that. And as we participate ourselves in these projects, as we run for political office, as we write music, as we improve our roads and highways, we do so beginning from the starting place. A fundamental conviction that Jesus is in this world reconciling it to himself. And that we are ambassadors and agents for Jesus attempting to bring our culture into a closer relationship with him. Now, time is slipping away, so what I'd like to do is end with just a couple of implications for this. What do you, what do, you do with this? What does this mean? What will this look like for Reformed Christians? How are we to live in a culture that is increasingly non-Christian? Because that, more and more, is our reality. And in some sense, this means that we need to return to our biblical roots. Because in those days, just like ours, non-believers vastly outnumbered the believers. So three just quick closing observations and implications. You might want to jot these down in your notes. First, a reformed view of culture implies that we have to eliminate insider-outsider thinking. We have to get rid of seeing people in two categories, as insiders and outsiders. So one of the texts I listed in your bulletin uh, for this message uh, is Jeremiah chapter 29. Lots of you know about this chapter because Well, because lots of you listed Jeremiah 29, verse 11 as your life verse out there on that wall. So I'd like to actually begin a bit earlier in that chapter to show you actually where Jeremiah 29 is pointing. I want to show you the context for that verse. Here's how the chapter begins. It tells us the point of this chapter. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So what we're about to read is a letter from God through Jeremiah to faithful believers who had been relocated into an unfriendly culture. They were now living in Babylon, hometown of a whole bunch of idol-worshiping peoples, peoples who had destroyed Jerusalem and other cities and burned their temple. Babylon... Babylon is like what today? Like Pyongyang or something? Uh, Las Vegas? Columbus, Ohio? It's a terrible place. Listen, though, to what God says to the people there in Babylon. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. By the way, I just just noticed that. God carried them into exile. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease 
and also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile and pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers you too will prosper now just hear that and think about what the text could have said God could have said yes you're in Babylon but make sure that you have nothing to do with those Babylonians they are messed up, so you should undermine their culture every chance that you get, because boy, are those guys in a wrong place. But that's not it, is it? God is saying instead that his people should contribute to Babylonian culture. They should work in architecture. They should grow vegetables. They should pray for the flourishing and peace and prosperity of that city, just like they had grown up praying for the same things for Jerusalem. Through Jeremiah, God even encourages them to play the dating game and to have children in this faraway city. You know, it's fascinating to me to see how much of this list of instructions from God. Instructions for living in a culturally fallen place looks like the list of instructions that Adam and Eve were given in the Garden of Eden. If you set them side by side, you'll find that Genesis 1 and Jeremiah 29 look a whole lot alike. Whether you're in the Garden of Eden or whether you're in a very adverse society, work for good things, pray for the city, increase and multiply. So here's the takeaway for us. We are increasingly living among Babylonians. We are. There are more and more things in our culture that are not biblical. And that we are absolutely right to find morally objectionable. And yet, we can't live under the manhole cover. We cannot avoid non-Christians and try to live all pure and separate. See, too often Reformed people get, get mislabeled due to caricatures of Calvinism. And they say that we see all people as either elect or damned. And therefore we treat them differently. But Reformed theology actually teaches that everybody's messed up. Everybody is lost without Jesus. And that we must take every opportunity we get to minister to our culture and seek the good of the cities and towns in which we live. So it means we cannot see people as insiders and outsiders and avoid them. How many non-Christian friends do you have? How often do you spend time with people that disagree with you? Pray for and seek the good of everyone around you. Second, it means, and let's just get real, that this perspective here is the more difficult way. And that we should expect pushback. From our culture. Culture will always trend toward its own self-preservation rather than biblical reformation. And as a result, the work of cultural transformation is always going to be the harder choice than assimilation or escapism. In Acts chapter 17, the apostle Paul does this. He takes a courageous step into cultural engagement when he starts preaching in one of the great cultural centers of the world, the Greek city of Athens. 
But in that engagement, Paul demonstrates his willingness to work with that culture. He like quotes Greek poetry. He, he walks and teaches in the midst of idols and altars to foreign gods. But what you see there is mixed results. Some people are interested in hearing Paul. A few think he's just a confused babbler, and some straight up sneered at him. We don't sneer so much today, but basically it's the New Testament equivalent of going and blogging about someone in a negative light, condescendingly. Friends, that's probably how it's going to go for us in many cases. Assimilating and escaping, these are always easier routes. But Jesus is calling us into these hard places. Places where the gods of our culture and the wise people of our time are most likely to protect their turf. But we're called to go because Jesus is Lord of all and every square inch of creation is his domain. Then lastly, it means that every career and calling makes a difference. Did you know that uh, prior to the Reformation in Europe, there was this line of thought that some professions, typically the ones that involved reading and writing, were way more important than all the others? If you could read or write, then you were in a profession that really counted, while everybody else was locked into their menial work and locked out of cultural influence. But the reformers came along and immediately began to challenge that perspective and taught a new theology of vocation. Vocation means your role in the world, whether you are a woodworker, a diesel mechanic, a middle school bookkeeper, or a stay-at-home mom. You can make a difference. I wonder if anybody here ever feels like their Monday through Friday grind isn't accomplishing anything. That, the, you know, that there are more important jobs out there. Have you ever felt that way? Reformed theology teaches that a plumber who goes to work for Jesus is of greater importance than a president who's only in it for himself. This week I was listening to a a talk by uh, a Reformed scholar named William Edgar, and he made a fascinating claim. Never heard this before. But he said that Martin Luther introduced the church to child-sized furniture to kid-sized seating. Because before that, they thought only the grown-ups matter, only the the, the priests matter. And Luther said, nope, in our church, we're going to have a spot at the table for the first graders because they can make a difference like anybody else can. They can change their culture. They can transform things. They're made in the image of God. Every person of every age and every career has a calling from God, and that gives you a responsibility and an opportunity to teach our culture about the gospel. Whether you're a pastor or you've got a paper route, whether you're a coach or a cook, whether you're an ambassador or an athlete or an artist, God will use you to impact culture for his glory. So let us go forth from this place to be agents of transformation, equipped and sent by the gospel into a world that desperately needs Jesus. Pray with me, will you? 
We ask, Heavenly Father, that we might see our world as a place to which we are called, not a place to escape from, not a, a boss to be obeyed, but an opportunity to share the gospel, to show love. Father, a lot of us have often felt like maybe we don't matter. Maybe we've been sell, ourselves been intimidated or afraid by what's happening in our culture. May this vision for cultural engagement as those who go forward with much to say and much to learn lead us along the way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we close and sing Follow You Anywhere.
immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power which is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, now and forevermore. Amen. Praise God from whom all